Hello and welcome to Video Game Hangover. I'm Randy Dickinson and I'm in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Hi, I'm DJ Ross. I am in Mountain View, uh, Mountain View, California. Yeah, still in California, yeah. I think. <laughs> is, is there a Mountain View in another state? Oh, they're they're all over the place. I think. Yeah, it's like a Springfield. Springfield. Yeah, I don't know if it's quite as prolific as Springfield, but I'm sure there's a Mountain View somewhere else. Or maybe I'm thinking of Mount- Monterey. Maybe that's it. Mountain View, Pennsylvania. Uh, hey, maybe Google, could be navigate to Mountain View, Pennsylvania. Um, like, each week on video game, we, all place. we do lessons about geography and study <laughs> maps. Cartography, That's what you really want to call that. learn yeah. learn geography from a couple of Americans. <laughs> uh, no, really, though, on video game hangover, we talk about the games that have been keeping us up at night. Uh, this week, that list includes Jusant. Star Ocean, the second story R, and Karma Zoo. Oh, Karma Zoo. Karma Zoo. Karma Zoo. There is a funny thing about Karma Zoo. The, um, the menus are narrated. Uh, there is a sort of deeply baritone kind of disembodied voice that narrates like the tutorial and, and some of the menus and stuff like that. So uh, when you select the beginning of the game, Karma Zoo, there's a voice that goes, Karma Zoo. Um, and there's two modes in the game. One is called totem and one is called loop. Uh, and the, the voice actor must have had just the best time <laughs> finding different ways to say karma zoo and loop. Cause it's not the same pronunciation, uh, uh, each time. Oh, well, that's um, good. So yeah, you, they did multiple takes. They did multiple takes. So it's, some of them are real silly. They were, he's like loop totem. And the next one is loop totem. Uh, and they back in, yeah. I, I tried to go through it to see how many different ones there are, and there are more than I can count. So, oh wow, um, okay, yeah. that's putting in the extra, you know, extra mile of effort. It that's puts good. Some pretty serious work into it. Yeah, <laughs> really serious about the menus in that game. <laughs> I mean, the rest of the game is a mess, but that that whole menu is <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, no, that's not true. I really like the game actually. We'll talk about it later. But yeah, um, yeah, was, uh, the voice actor was clearly having a lot of fun reading the menus. We need something to do uh, in between uh, recording for the Resident Evil games, probably. <laughs> right. Resident Evil 9. Yeah. Or whatever. Gotta, you know, whatever nine number they're on now. He's got a... Probably on his resume somewhere, he's got to keep that off of LinkedIn or else Capcom's going to fire him for the next uh, installment. <laughs> um, yeah. We... um. We're, we're rapidly approaching the end of the year here, DJ. Have you started your holiday shopping yet? Uh, no, of course not. It's no. not even uh, December yet. No. Let alone December 24th, which is, you, you know, are. when I <laughs> is that my shopping. Traditionally, when do you start your holiday shopping? You know, there there was a stretch of time when I would just, like, that's when I would do it. I would just set aside the whole day, and I have my list, and I would go out and do it on the 24th. Maybe the 23rd, maybe the 24th is cutting it a little close. Uh, but no, I would do it super last minute. Um, yes, I, I lived that life as well. Um, that's just because that's how I prefer to do it, though. It's not out of like procrastination or anything. Oh. Uh, now I it's out of pro- procrastination. Now it's not intentional <laughs> <Right. laughs> anymore. <laughs> yeah. My, I, well, I, I always worked retail. So we always had one of the companies I worked for, we always had Christmas Eve off. It was like one of the only days we consistently had off. So. It felt like at that time of year, it was the only free day I actually had to do my Christmas shopping. So, mm-hmm. um, so I would, you know, not have to work retail that day, but still had to go to the freaking mall. <laughs> this is your favorite place. Yes, it was great. <laughs> like, oh, it's your day off. What are you doing here? Yeah. I'm like, I don't know. My Just life going is going back here. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, at least I knew all the good places to park and like, you know, when they changed the pretzels at Auntie Anne's. Right, right. Well, to answer your question, no, I have not done my, or I have not started my Christmas shopping. No, nor have I. I don't know what my point of that was. Oh, 
back half of the year, end of the year. We're doing end of the year things. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Um, coming up in the most immediate future, happy Thanksgiving to our listeners here in the United States. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. And then um, the week after Thanksgiving is Giving Tuesday. Oh. After you have just indulged in mindless shopping and and getting up at 5 a.m. to go to Target and things like that, um, there's a day to purify your soul <laughs> by giving money to charities. If you would like to support Extra Life, um, that would be a fantastic thing to do on Tuesday. Um, you can go to vghangover.com slash Extra Life and, uh, and donate to this amazing charity that DJ and I are big fans of. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. still going through the end of the year. We've already had yeah. a really terrific year on game day a couple of weeks ago. Seems like a lifetime ago at this point. <laughs> but um, no, the, the donation button still works through December 31st. So if you're interested in maybe chipping in some dollars, uh, especially on Giving Tuesday, I don't know if there's anything special that happens if you do it that day specifically. But um, like Randy was saying, maybe you're just trying to look, restore some kind of cosmic balance after Thanksgiving and Black Friday and all that. Yeah, You can definitely do that up until the end of the year. So feel free to head over to vghangover.com slash extra life where you can find all of that donation information. Ooh, that rhymed. It did. Amazing. You're a poet and you don't know it. <laughs> oh man, getting late. <laughs> and then um, we, uh, we, we're wrapping up the year with our, um, a, a classic video game hangover tradition, the Drunktacular. Oh, it's coming. If um if this was the first year that someone was listening to video game DJ uh, hangover DJ, how would you describe what the drunk tacular is? Uh, the drunk tacular. I, I was just thinking about this. <laughs> I don't know if it was today or why I was even thinking about this, but you know, the whole year here at VG Hangover, it's all about uh, you know what Randy and I have been up to, what we've been playing, stuff we want to talk about. The drunk tacular, in addition to being our season finale is the show which is all about you, the listeners. It's about what you want to talk about. And what we mean by that is we want you to call in and uh, ask us questions or just tell us things <laughs> that <laughs> we will put on the show that week. Sure. I mean, typically it's people ask questions and we answer them. They can be, like, they can cover any range of things. They can be questions about Video games. They can be questions about automobile repair. Mm -hmm. They can be, uh, you know, people love the desert island question. What would you do? <laughs> what was? What's the one special item you'd like to have if you're stranded on a desert island? That sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But we will uh, collect all of your questions and spend the entirety of that episode answering them. But why is it called the Drunktacular? Why? I don't know. Why? That's kind of a weird thing to call it. If, why don't we just call it like the the call in show or something? The question and answer show. Yeah, uh, because we um, we drink uh, pretty aggressively during the recording <laughs> of the episode. I don't know who we'd call it aggressively. <laughs> I actually was challenged by uh, by my partner Sarah this evening that we don't get drunk enough on the drunk tacular for her. Oh really? Um, okay, well, yeah. okay. Wait. Well, so what is that based on? She um she has listened and tuned in for previous episodes of this show. Um, and, uh, does not feel that you and I fully embrace the potential of the drunk hacking. Really? Okay. Well, um, I think to which I I've mean, said, we still have to record a show. That's, that's true. Yeah. I would say, I mean, I think sh she's not wrong. Mm. We could definitely take it a lot farther, but here's another <laughs> thing. So I've, I've listened to these episodes after, you know, being a participant and the, the drunkenness does not fully come across in the audio. So you oh. should sort of take my word for it. <laughs> yes. Maybe you should tune into the live stream. Oh, did we mention there's a live stream? Mm -hmm. We'll be recording this live on Friday, December the 8th, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, tentatively, on twitch.tv slash vghangover. So if you'd like to be a live participant, you can even uh, you know drop your questions in the chat right there. Yeah. You will be able to witness this year's Drunktacular Live um, and <laughs> maybe... Maybe there will be some visual evidence of how much we're actually drinking. Sure. And afterwards, you can sort of rate us on our level of drunkenness. Yeah. Yeah. If it was su sufficiently drunk enough to call it a drunktacular, or uh, is this just marketing? I feel like it has been. <laughs> I feel like it's been. <laughs> we have earned the title for the last few yeah. years. I've, I, yeah. I've, we've certainly had years where I was more drunk than others. Um, 
but uh but yeah i think i've i generally embrace it i will um hmm i'll have to make sure that i'm not doing some little sipping beer this year i'll have to get something a little more intense Mm -hmm. boy are you like taking that as a challenge are you gonna step it up this year yeah i think i gotta i gotta i mean she's a listener we have to (laughs) meet the listener's expectations right all right all right well i'm looking forward to hearing uh her call-in question in that case Mm. oh okay i think that's only fair i'll have to put her up to that (laughs) we've never heard sarah's voice on the podcast before Oh, that's true. Oh, this, is, this could be a you know an eventful episode, <laughs> you know, a landmark episode in, in VGH history. Yeah, we did mention. So we want your questions. You can send them to us pretty much any way. You can get in touch with us. You can tweet us um, twitter dot com slash vghangover. You can email us contact at vghangover dot com. That's the email, right? Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. can uh, you can message it to us on Discord. But the thing that we clung to all these years is you can call us on the phone, <laughs> you know, like a telephone, at 682-999-VGH1, and you can actually record a little voicemail that we will then play on the show and respond to. We won't answer your question. Like, we're not going to pick up if you call that number. It's solely for recording a voicemail. Right. But it's a fun way to, you know, get your voice on the show, be a part of VGH history. And you can get all this information, all the contact information, the live stream info, all that stuff. Again, if you just go to vghangover.com slash drunk, and it's all there waiting for you. So <laughs> really looking forward to hearing your questions this year and um, have, hopefully having you join us on the stream to help us uh, not ring in. What do you call it when the, the you're wrapping it up? Ring out. Sense, <laughs> is it just a ring out? <laughs> Sounds like you're playing a virtual fighter. <laughs> to help us send off another year in uh, VGH history. To wrap up. Wrap up another year. Wrap up another year. There we go. Yep, yeah. We're not, I'm not even drinking yet. This, right. this is, so imagine how exciting it's going to be on the mm-hmm. on the 8th when we actually do this. I'll have to play that for Sarah and see if she believes you. <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah, always a good time. Always a fun year to end. Uh, uh, always a fun way to end the year uh, with uh, with my buddy DJ and our listeners and, and taking calls and questions and and having a few adult beverages. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's coming up soon, sooner than we were anticipating. So <laughs> if you got some burning questions on your mind, make sure to uh, you know, get them in ahead of time so we can make sure they're all accounted for. Yep. Cool. Well, I think you've uh, explored all the ways that people can reach out. Uh, we, we are very available. It's super easy to find us. We are always in the Discord. Um, you can drop messages there. You can uh, private message us on Discord as well. Uh, DJ and I both have our own kind of inboxes at randy at vghangover.com, DJ at vghangover.com. There is the aforementioned contact at vghangover.com that goes to kind of our generic inbox. Our intern reads those. Um, <laughs> and uh, and yeah, there's no shortage of other ways. So there is no excuse for not reaching out. No excuse. No excuse. You there listening, the one who's always like, oh, you I know, mean, I have a, some questions I might ask. But, but I have so many excuses for outreach. So many excuses. I'll just send it in next year. No, we want to hear yep. from you. So this is the year. This is the year we hear from yep. all those people who you just put it off till the next year. This is your time to shine. Yeah, we're waiting for you specifically. Don't be creeped out or anything. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, new business, old business. I think we wrapped up some business. We want to talk about video games? Uh, we just talk about video games. Yeah. I realized this week, or this year, actually, is a a very significant year in not really video gaming history, but what tipped me off to this was um, I learned today that The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time turns 25 this week. Ooh. Came out in the US, in the US, I think, on November 21st, 1998. So that make it 25 uh, years old this week. That sounds right. Yeah, if my numbers are correct, which is yep. they're often not, but just because <laughs> I don't have a good understanding of how time works. But uh, it just made me realize, like, man, 1998, uh, I, for the longest time, I have regarded as maybe the best year in video games <laughs> since they came into existence. Hmm. There were just so many heavy hitters that year. It was like Ocarina of Time. If I remember this correctly, uh, Metal Gear Solid, uh, Xeno Gears, a bunch of other just really huge titles came out that that year, which which makes me think like any time you hear somebody saying like, "Oh man, 
this year might be the best year for video games ever. A lot of people are saying that about 2023, in fact. Um, I just have to point them to 1998 and just be like, oh, excuse me, you've forgotten <laughs> something. You've forgotten about this incredible year. Huh. Um, but this it kind of stuck I up mean, on me. This is a pretty good list. I'm Googled, I just Googled uh, best video games of 1990, uh, 1998. And uh, yeah, there's all bangers. A lot of bangers here. Yeah, yeah. Some of it, I think it's like it shares it a little bit with 1997 because a lot of these games were like they came out in in Japan in 1997, but didn't make it over to the US in 98. But it's still like that span of time was just an incredible stretch for video games. What was the point, the tipping point for like a worldwide release? Do you have a sense of that? At what point did the these kind of staggered releases stop happening and everything kind of came out on the same day across the world? Uh, I feel like they started getting much better about it during, like, the PS3, 360 generation. Yeah. It was, it's surprisingly recent, because uh, I I think the more I look back at old video games and release dates, it always sort of seems like, particularly, obviously, J- Japanese developers yeah. came out in Japan first, and then a year a year later, sometimes more later, it came out in the U.S., until fairly recently. Mm-hmm. I'm sure it, like, is staggered, and it really depends on the developer, but that's sort of when I remember everything starting to sync up. Maybe late PS2, even? Hmm. But even then, that was for, like, you know, the larger profile titles. Like, I think Final Fantasy XII came out um, internationally the same day. I could be wrong about that. And do you do you remember if that was the... Not, I mean, I won't hold you against it. it hold it against you if you're, you're not sure, but it, do you remember if that was the first Final Fantasy game to do that? Um, you know, now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure that it did not come out uh, internationally the same day. I think oh, okay. 13 <laughs> did. Huh. But that was like PS3, 360 generation. Right. All right. Cool. Sorry, that was not your point. I apologize. But as you were talking about it, it was something I was thinking about. Yeah, well, I mean, the stuff like um, the, the ones that I mentioned, like Xenogears and Metal Gear Solid, still had that staggered um, release. So. Even with that in mind, though, I think, uh, you know, 1998 is still a crazy year for video games. I have yeah. I didn't even really, like, it didn't occur to me until I, I saw the Zelda news today. But I was just, like, looking back after reading that and thinking, like, oh, yeah, they did just have some, like, big thing for Metal Gear. And then um, there was a note about Xenogears turning 25. And mm-hmm. it was like, oh, no, it's all happening. All these these amazing games that came out in uh, in 98. Are Half-Life. Having Half, uh, Steam has been wild with Half-Life, and there's a big yeah. documentary about uh, the development and kind of uh, uh, 25 years of uh, of iterations on Half-Life essentially since then. Yeah, yeah. Half-Life I forget about because I was not really playing PC games at the time, but that was like, that was enormous as far as PC releases went. I mean, like a just total um, watershed title. So yeah, I didn't even realize, but the 25th anniversary of this crazy year in gaming uh, is here, and we're almost <laughs> at the end of the year, and I really haven't <laughs> been doing anything to commemorate if that's um, something people do. But man, it's kind of shocking just to see that Zelda is that old. Yeah, I mean, it's the, a lot of these are games that I didn't get to until much later. I, I didn't play Ocarina of Time until it came out for the 3DS in the 2000s. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Half-Life, I don't think I played that until it came out on the Xbox in the 2000s. Uh, things like Spyro the Dragon and Mario Party. What else is on the list? The list, uh, Tomb Raider three. These are all games that I went back to much, much later. So um, to realize that they all came out in this one kind of banner year is a little, a little mind blowing. Yeah, yeah. Even like when I go back and look at the list, it's kind of crazy. I was like, oh, this game and this game. Oh, it's it's crazy <laughs> to think about, especially considering how long development cycles are now. You just never right. see another game that is th- or another year that is this stacked. Yeah. Well, and particularly as much as uh, release dates kind of move around and, you know, try to carve out a specific week for themselves and make sure there's no other big competition so that you kind of own the headlines and the review cycle for that period. So there's I think there's a big art to landing the ideal release date at this point, similar to the way the movies and, and, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. music come out that uh, um, probably was not a front of mind concern in the late 90s. Yeah. No, at that point, they were just pumping them out as fast as right. they could, it seemed like. Exactly. Huh. Man, Ridge Racer 4 is on there. Just speaking of Ridge Racer, once again. But anyway, so I don't know what my larger point is, but man, I, <laughs> that was just such an amazing year. It's, the uh, larger it's point is we feel old. That. <laughs> That's, I mean, yes, <laughs> that was sort of a secondary response to me seeing the headline. I was just like, oh my God, 
25 <laughs> years. Where where were you in 1998? What, where were you in life, in your career? What, what, <laughs> what, what is notable about your consumption of video games from that time? I think I was either, I think I was a sophomore in high school in 1998, sophomore or no. junior. You know, doing just stuff that a, a high schooler would do, nothing incredibly exciting. High school things? Yeah, you know. It still blew my mind that uh, at one day in November or so in 1998, I walked into a electronics boutique and picked up both Metal Gear Solid and Xeno Gears. Just like, oh, two of the best games of all time just coming out on the same <laughs> day. Um, kind of ridiculous. Yeah, I am. I don't know where I was at in gaming at, at that point. I uh, I was in my mid-20s. I was well past high school at that point. So Ooh. I don't um, I don't know. I think I was working at a movie theater at the time. Yeah. I was definitely sort of like half-heartedly chipping away at college courses with no real direction in mind. Uh, I did that for like 10 years after high school. So, <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah, probably living in a house with two other dudes. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just kind of scraped together something that felt like a grown-up life. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I don't, I don't remember having a lot of time for video games. Certainly didn't play anything on this list upon release. So it's uh, hard to re sort of remember back to that point and, and uh, think of how I was using my free time. Mm. Probably music, probably concerts, probably yeah. movies, very much into movies. Like I said, I was working at a movie theater, I think, at the time, so... Definitely very much a movie guy. What were the big movies in 98? It was like <laughs> the Roland Emmerich Godzilla, I think. <laughs> you said best movies. No, um, like big movies. So I know, oh, I, movies. I know what the best movies were. Which Star Trek came out that year? Best movies of 1998. Um, the Big Lebowski came out in 1998. Oh. Um, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. This is not as good a list as video games. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really you, looking you know, here. You can't top that year for video games. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, American well, History X. <laughs> Pi. The X-Files. Not, not the, oh, the X-Files movie. Uh, Rushmore. No, not the movie. I think just the TV series at that point. The X-Files have been around for a while since then, right? Yeah, yeah. Not quite the banner hmm. year for movies, I guess, that it was for video games. But Bride of Chucky. <laughs> okay well <laughs> all right well this is getting this is uh we, we veered off of your observation i think so um yeah. well cool that's uh that's uh it's, yeah definitely interesting in hindsight to realize that all of those were kind of happening concurrently i wish i had this sort of sense of mind to realize where where what was happening at the moment <laughs> um well next year when we do the 1999 anniversary you can do a uh, a perfect dark show or something like that i think that was right <laughs> <laughs> that was a good year that was probably the year that got me back to gaming actually because it was really perfect dark and yeah it was really perfect dark that, that was it yeah that's all it takes <laughs> but anyway so coincidentally or maybe not coincidentally um i found myself playing uh the demo for star ocean the second story this week which is a remake it's like it's very complicated actually so it's I guess a remastering of a remake of this PlayStation one RPG that came out in the U S in 1998, I believe yeah. it was ported to PSP. And I think some of that has been brought over into this version, but this is one of my like low key favorite RPGs from the PlayStation one generation. Uh, although I forget about it because like they've released a lot of sequels since then and, and they have not been very well regarded. So I just kind of forget that this series exists. But I remember like when it came out on PlayStation 1, it was like this weird sort of like sci-fi looking JRPG. The intro movie starts out with like this huge spaceship flying through the like the stars like you would see in Star Trek or Star Wars or something. And it's just like, oh wow, what is going on here? This doesn't look like any other JRPG that I've played. Like it just looks like they're trying to make a Star Trek RPG or something. <laughs> um, and then my favorite thing about it is that they kind of pull a fast one, and then all the like sci-fi um, trappings drop away in the first hour, and then you're just stuck playing <laughs> like more or less a traditional fantasy RPG, which is like okay, wait a minute. <laughs> but it still maintains some of the like weird sci-fi elements throughout, uh, and like the original was a very fun game, so. And stuck to this, the sci-fi 
outline? There's a little bit in there, yeah. It's not it's not as sci-fi as something like I don't know, Zeno's. Uh, I don't want to get this mixed up. Uh, Zeno Saga or Zeno Blade, <laughs> but you know the the sci-fi and fantasy stuff continues to sort of like intersect throughout the the course of the game. The premise is so it's kind of weird. So there was like Star Ocean One, where um, which I never played. So I, this is all that I gleaned from just re- reading the Wikipedia summary this week. But you play as like three characters who are basically just JRPG characters in a typical JRPG setting, this kind of fantasy planet. And then at some point during the storyline, basically you meet the captain of the starship and one of his crewmates um, who are on some mission that brings them to your planet. And then they join you and you, you play out the rest of the game with them. And then, so Star Ocean 2 takes place 20 years later. And you play as the son of that starship captain, which is like a really interesting connection back to the first game, which I was only vaguely aware of. Um, and then Star Ocean Two starts out you're you're on this mission on your dad's starship, and you go on uh, essentially like a Star Trek away mission down to the surface of some planet to investigate an ancient alien artifact or something. And you are just <laughs> this like stupid idiot first year <laughs> space cadet kind of guy. So you mess with the alien artifact, and it it portals you away to um, a completely different planet. And that is where you like basically just find yourself stuck on this JRPG planet with no way back to the starship. And you spend a lot of the rest of the game trying to figure out how to get back home while dealing with, you know, whatever's going on on this JRPG planet. So like I was saying, they kind of pull a fast one with the, the sci-fi trappings, but um, eventually it all comes together. So it is the um, Back to the Future 3 of Star Ocean. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit. I mean, I can't speak for the rest of the series, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's a little bit. Back to the Future Part 3. <laughs> um, huh. Another fun twist is when you arrive on this planet, you are um, just the manner in which you appear on the planet and, um, you know, based on your weird clothing and your, your weird space gun, it's like all the inhabitants sort of make you out to be like like this legendary hero that was foretold um would arrive in their village so like that's just another ridiculous jrpg spin it's like oh it's the hero <laughs> of light he's here to save us and meanwhile you're just like no i'm just some idiot trying to get back to his spaceship but yeah so this is a remastering i guess of the ps1 game the ps1 the game story r version is it yeah, yeah. I, th- I guess the R stands for a remake or something ah. ridiculous. Like they could just spell it out in the title. They had to be all cute <laughs> with it. The the PS One game to me, it kind of looked like if you had just, um, you know, if they had just kept making sixteen bit JRPGs with thirty um, two bit technology. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like fully three D. It was kind of using the like Resident Evil slash Final Fantasy seven technique of having these um like 3d pre-rendered backdrops that you would run little 2d sprites around so it was very surprising so i loaded this up and all the backgrounds all the environments are completely redone in full 3d i mean it's not like you i think you can't really rotate the camera around but it's sort of like playing one of those um uh like hd 2d games like um, the Live Alive remake or Octopath Traveler, where it's um, right. kind of the pseudo 3D background that you're just, you know, you're still a 2D sprite walking around. But the environments look like really incredible. Uh, and I wasn't really expecting this to look terrific or anything because, you know, this is the second time this has been remade. I don't know how much, I don't know how much like stake Square Enix has in it at this point. I don't know how there's a huge audience for these things, so I wasn't expecting this much like sort of effort put into it. <laughs> but it, it looks really good. Like the the backgrounds, especially, they're not like they're not like you know high end like AAA video game backgrounds. Uh, in fact, the longer you look at them, you can kind of see like oh, this is just like this dinky looking like 3D grass, or you know, it doesn't look terrific, but just something about it, like the way they've lit all of the environments, just makes it look incredibly striking um, and almost photorealistic. 
<laughs> which is even weirder because you're still just these little 2D sprites sort of like walking around these very realistic looking environments. But um, I've, so I've been very impressed with just the, the new presentation. We spent a lot of time in the demo. Just um, the demo is like the opening hours of the game. So you spend a little bit of time on the away mission and then you go uh, to like the first couple of areas and towns on this new planet that you find yourself on. Uh, and then you get to do a little bit of um, of battles, which are... Uh, this was pretty unique for, um, like, at the time when Star Ocean came out. They're, like, they're action-based. And the ones in the demo are fairly simple because you only have a couple of characters. But essentially, like, you just run up to... Um, you, like, control your character on the battle screen and you like run up and just sort of button mash and occasionally you can throw out a special ability which is similar to like casting a spell or just using a character skill in another game uh and then the rest of the time like you just spend trying to evade their the enemy attacks because they're also chasing you on the screen but it's, so it's very different than something like a final fantasy or dragon quest or you know any of the other countless jrpgs that were coming out at the time mm-hmm and if I remember correctly, it gets quite chaotic because eventually you have a, like three or four party members and there are a bunch of you know, huge enemies on the screen. They're all doing crazy attacks and it's up to you to sort of manage all your uh, party's abilities to uh, to get through each battle. Uh, cool. I didn't realize this was a very recent release. This just came out. Yeah, it just came out, I think, um, like earlier this month. I think the cool. demo might have been out for a while, but... I just happened to find myself playing it this week. I was honestly not really expecting a lot out of it. I just sort of loaded it up on a whim because I was like, oh, Star Ocean 2. I remember that game. That was pretty good. Um, but, but then I found myself thinking like, oh, wow, this is like this is so much more impressive than I was expecting. Maybe I, it's time <laughs> I, I replay this game. Because, so first of all, I don't, like, despite remembering um really enjoying this when it was on the ps1 i don't remember a whole lot about like the story or really what happened in the game so i thought you know it might be nice to revisit it and also it's one of these games where you have um like right away it gives you the choice of two protagonists and based on which one you pick the story it's like largely the same but along the way you will encounter different characters who join your party and they're like story beats that differ based on which character you pick. So I thought, oh, maybe I will just play as the other character this time because I only went through this one time initially with one of the characters. Oh, interesting. Yeah. There's also, um, they introduced the system of, um, like, inter-party relationships. So, like, if you go into a town, you have the option of, like, chatting or hanging out with different members of your party and based on how that plays out, you you will like your relationship with them will change. It's very sort of like persona like, but I think it will actually um, in this case it, it will change how some of the characters behave in battle, which is kind of different. Yeah, uh, there was also like a whole crafting system, which I I'm pretty sure I did not even get into. Um, there was just so much going on in this game when it initially came out that it was a little overwhelming. Uh, but somehow I managed to just muddle my way through it. I, was just, I remember <laughs> thinking the crafting sounded um, kind of interesting, but I just it turned out to not be necessary to finish the game, so I kind of put it aside and never looked back at it. But man, just looking at it now, just, I can't believe that uh, <laughs> it's just an enormous game, just sort of stealth dropped. Um, like Star Ocean is not really a thing that's on my radar these days. But it's back, and uh, by <laughs> most accounts, this is the best one in the series. So it could be worth a look, and th- despite also trying to get through Persona 3 at the same time. <laughs> who knows? Maybe I'll just add another 100-hour RPG onto this deck. Um, if you were to play it, do you think you would play this version of it? Oh, I think so. Like, as opposed yeah. to really like going back and playing the original? Yeah. yeah. I think so. Yeah, I think... The, the new coat of paint is very enticing. The uh, They've made some changes to the battle system as well, which uh, they've added, like, um, I think you can... This is like... I don't know why this is in every game now. You can, like, if you hit the enemy enough, 
they will be stunned or you'll like put them into a break state and where you do more damage but like now that's something you can do in star ocean and there's some sort of counter system where you can parry enemy attacks uh which is new and that's kind of interesting oh it's not like oh now i have to play it because those features are in here but it's just you know another way of keeping it um fresh a little bit yeah well you had sort of described the combat as kind of button mashy so this sounds like it's like maybe a little more a little more thoughtful yeah, I, I mean, it starts out very button mashy. I remember it getting uh, to be quite difficult towards the end. So I'd also just like to sort of remember how it progressed because it's been quite a while. So it's been 25 years probably since I played this thing. <laughs> um, cool. But yeah, so just total coincidence ended up playing a, uh, a you know 1998 classic because they just re released it this week. Uh, nice. And I wish there was more, um, two things. I wish there were more two and a half D remakes of old RPGs. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, it's very attractive. Uh, and Octopath Traveler and what's the other one? The, um, Bravely Live Default Alive? and stuff like oh. that. Oh, Live Alive. Yeah, I was interested in Live Alive. I should go back and play that. Was that this year? You should. No, it was a couple of years ago, I think. Or was it last year? Might have been last Might year. Might have been last year. Yeah. Um, I think you'd be into that. Yeah, that, like, yeah, that's also not very long compared to a lot of these other games. Yeah. Uh, I think I have it. I think I may have bought it during one of the sales, too. Yeah, I should do it. I'm going to write that down right now. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good call. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, Dragon Quest IX is, uh, like, was the game that got me into Dragon Quest. And I keep thinking, geez, I would, maybe I should revisit that. Like, now that I've played 100 more RPGs, mm-hmm. maybe I would have a different perspective on Dragon Quest IX. But yeah, but maybe they could polish that up and bring it out for modern consoles on with some beautiful two and a half D sprites and things like that. Yeah. It's a popular rumor. the dragon quest nine remake. I don't know how much uh, weight there is to it, but uh, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, Uh, Something you'll appreciate about this is that there are no more random battles. The enemies just pop up on the overworld map. Uh, These little, these little cloudy blobs, which is kind of fun. (laughs) <laughs> and then it's just like, you know, you can, if you want to fight one, you can you go bump into them. Otherwise, you can try and walk around them. But uh, you are never just thrown into a battle against your will. Uh, I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, that's, a huge yeah, that's nice. Uh, cool. Are there any old RPGs that you would like to get the 2.5D treatment? Uh, so, what, like, it was originally a 2D RPG, and now it's, it's sort of yeah. like, uh, hmm. Uh, there are a bunch of weird, like Super Nintendo RPGs that I would love to come back, but I think none of them are uh, especially popular. Sure, there's right. like it does require a certain profile, yeah. right? I I was a big fan. There was a series called Lufia on the Super Nintendo, which are actually fairly well known compared to the other stuff that I was prepared to just rattle off. But uh, <laughs> I think those would be well received. Like there are a lot of fans of the the Lufia games on the Super Nintendo. What would I go for if I was just going for a completely insane choice? Um, I'd probably pick one of the ones um, sort of in the Live Alive camp where they just never came out in the U.S. So if I could sort of kill two birds with one stone, just get a, an HD 2D remake and also a game that I've never played before. Um, it would be stuff like um, there's this game Mystic Arc for the the Super Famicom. And then there are these two other big sort of square RPGs, um, Bahama Lagoon and what's the other one? Uh, Rudra's Treasure. Yeah, still, I mean, they've, I think they've gotten fan translation patches at this point, but no official release. So if they could do the live live treatment with both of those, that would be terrific. Hmm. Huh. Uh, yeah, I've heard of Lufia, but I've not heard of any, any of the other yeah. ones. So. <laughs> you are correct. Lufia is pretty just sort of by the numbers JRPG. It's pretty good. And the second one especially had a lot of weird like mini games and little little fun extras to mm. it, but uh, you know nothing especially mold breaking. Uh, cool. The other thing I was going to wish for was um, more sci fi themed uh, RPGs. And yeah, I would like that as well. Yeah, I think. I mean. I was saying, so I haven't played any of the the Star Ocean games after this. I believe a few of them stick to the sci-fi sort of genre a little closer <laughs> than the earlier ones did. But um, I don't know if any of them are like fully sci-fi. That remains to be seen. Um, but yeah, in general, I think that would be cool. 
just like more sort of games in the JRPG format, but just not on like a fantasy planet, like with dragons and yes. magic and everything. It'd be kind of fun. And some generic blonde guy. Yeah. God, the hero in this is just another stupid blonde kid. Unbelievable. I was just <laughs> complaining to the guy in um, in Silent Hope. I was just like, oh, where have I seen this right. guy before? Oh, it's just the guy from Star <laughs> Ocean, except, you know. In everything, yeah, right? Yeah. They, um, I think that they, I mean, the voice acting in this version is different than in the previous one. I mean, the, on the PlayStation 1, it didn't have full voice acting. It had, um, <laughs> it had like the cheesiest like in battle voices, like whenever a character would do an attack, they would they'd scream some absurd thing, and that was about all the voice acting you got out of it. Um, this new one is fully voiced, which I don't know if I'm excited about because it's just a lot of dialogue. And uh, the guy, I, I don't like the the voice actor doing the 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 main guy. Like he does a good job, but I don't know if um, he just sounds kind of dorky, which maybe tracks for the type of character he's supposed to be. But I feel like it's just like, you know, could have dialed it down a couple notches. He sounds like, um, <laughs> it just sounds like Fry from Futurama, which is yeah. like, you know, a, a little bit silly. Maybe sillier than you want a, a JRPG protagonist to sound. But, uh, you know, if you're into voice acting, I know people love the voice acting. People are just like, mm. when are they going to have a fully voiced Zelda game? Which sounds like a nightmare to me, but uh, people are into <laughs> it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm already, like, annoyed by the thought of a fully voiced Zelda movie. Let alone <laughs> yeah. Video game. What if so. there's just no dialogue <laughs> in the Zelda movie? It's very, like, avant-garde. Cool. Bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what you want? <laughs> um i mean it's been good enough for video games thus far yeah. so yeah what if all the other characters talk except whenever a link has to say something he's just like eh? 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 <laughs> uh sure all right well <laughs> yeah see what ends up happening it's better than he talks and it's Chris Pratt's voice coming. Yeah. Oh, no, it's just going to be him again. They, they, they booked him for everything. He's Mario. He's Link. He's going to be Samus in the Metroid movie. He's, gonna, mm. he's Garfield now. Did you hear that? I think I, yeah, I think I did hear that. Do, yeah. Like, do we need another Garfield movie? Uh, yeah. That, that, I mean, that's a whole other conversation, obviously. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's fine. Um, like, you can play yeah. Garfield. I, I have no sort of like, no investment in that. No emotional attachment to Garfield as a character. Yeah. <clears throat> well, cool. What have I been playing? We, you and I both played Jusant. We finished Jusant. Yeah. Did you finish Jusant? I finished Jusant. Yeah. This was a game we started during, or at least I started during Extra Life. I think you started shortly afterwards, mm -hmm. right? Um, and um, I think we talked about briefly on our Extra Life episode. Um, but now that we've completed it, we wanted to sort of revisit it. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is um this is the new game by Don't Nod, uh, the folks who have made the Life of Strange games and uh, Remember Me and what was the other one? Van they made Vampire, Vampire, um, and some other stuff. What else did they make? Uh, they made Tell Me Why, and there I think that's go. about all. That might be the. Oh no, they did yeah. um the Harmony Fall of Reverie, uh, from earlier this year. Oh, um and um. The hook here is that you are um, a person climbing a mountain, or, or, or I guess it's a mountain. It's a spire for the, yeah, of some for, kind. For practical purposes, it's a mountain, or like a tower, I yeah. guess. A tower, that's a good word, yeah. Um, and it's massive. Um, yeah. And it uses kind of an interesting control scheme. Um, it, to me, it feels like marionette controls, or like the old Assassin's Creed games, mm -hmm. um, where the right button is your right hand or the right, I'm sorry, trigger is your right hand and the left trigger is your left hand. Um, and you're using the sticks to kind of reach out and find a place to hold on to. Uh, you squeeze the trigger, it squeezes your hand, you hold on to the thing and then you lather, rinse, repeat and make your way up the mountain. You have to juggle things like, uh, like, you know, putting pythons in the, uh, uh, in the side of the mountain to hold you in place and, uh, um, uh, make sure you have enough rope to get to your next, uh, obstacle or objective, uh, you have to measure your stamina and keep an eye on that and, and take occasional breaks to take a deep breath and shake your arms out <laughs> and continue climbing the mountain. Um, all of this sounds very uh, cumbersome, uh, but uh, it works really 
mostly pretty well, I think. Yeah, I really like the climbing in this. It, uh, it's very, like, I don't want to say, like, realistic, because, you know, you're still just playing a video game, but it's it's very, like, it's a good simulation of, um, or it feels like you're climbing something in this game more so than it yeah. does if you're playing, like, Uncharted or Tomb Raider, where you're just pressing the X button to hop between, like, handholds on a wall. But right. you really have to be um, very thoughtful about how you move um, from one handle to the next. Um, you need to consider sort of like what is in reach and like you said, your stamina and sort of how much rope you have left. There are a bunch of fun little things you can do as well. Like you can sort of like jump up to the next handhold if it's um, if it's a little too far to grab, but you can, you know, sort of hop to it. Um, you yeah. can do the thing. And you sacrifice some of your stamina to do that. So it has to be kind of a strategic thought Yeah, about how to get there. And, and do I have the energy to keep climbing after that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, you can do the thing where you like sort of, it's not like repel down the wall, but you uh, like extend your rope down and, and sort of run along the side of the wall like a pendulum or something. And then use that to, to jump to the next uh, safe ledge or stuff like that. But... Um, just a lot of sort of fun rock climbing uh, like stuff, for lack of a better descriptor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they, I, um, I mean, I'm a big fan, obviously, of of Uncharted and Tomb Raider, but the way that those games handle climbing is is really you just look for like the yellow glowy bit, and you know that you can safely climb to that place. Yeah, um, yeah, and there really are not a lot of tells in Jusan about where you can go. You start to sort of read the geography after over a while, and. And you sort of get a sense of like what look climbable and what isn't. Um, but there's no glowy bits in Jusan. <laughs> You're really just sort of like looking for purchase anywhere you can get it. Um, and yeah. Uh, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting in that way. And it does mix it up with some like fantasy type elements later uh, where there are, um, you know, there are plants you can sort of make grow. And if you hold on to the side of them, they'll move you up. Uh, those are always fun. <laughs> Two different places, mm -hmm. uh, much faster and much easier than you would otherwise be able to. There's like paths of like rock bugs that climb along the side of the mountain that you can kind of hold on to um, and they'll carry you to the next objective. And, and uh, so you can go even from bug to bug and to get along quicker. Um, those were fun, too. So, yeah, there's definitely enough kind of variety to kind of keep it interesting and engaging. Um, it is surprisingly physical, though, like there were periods where I, as the player, would have to like put the controller down and like shake oh, out really? my hands and yeah. fingers and. Uh, cause I was like death grip on the controller, like squeezing onto the triggers, holding on to the side of the mountain. So I didn't fall off. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I definitely, I felt like it was like making my hands cramp after a few <laughs> hours. Um, but, uh, Hey, there's some reality for you. It feels like a real yeah. rock climbing experience. It reminded me of two other games. Um, one I mentioned last week or whenever we talked about this, which is Grow Home, where you play as a robot who is climbing up this yeah. big plant. Um, but it controls very similarly as where you're like using the buttons to, um, to grab onto stuff and maintain a grip on it. And then the other one is Shadow of the Colossus, which is the first time I can kind of remember a game using one of the shoulder buttons to like grab something. But oh, that was how you would hang on to stuff in that game. And I remember I had a very similar reaction after playing a lot of that game where, you know, a lot of the time you're hanging on for dear life because you're, like, climbing this huge monster who is trying to shake you off. And all you can do is hold the shoulder <laughs> button to, like, try and keep your grip as your stamina meter counts down. Yeah. But and ever then you since have to then, kill it, which is terrible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But then ever since that, I was just like, oh, that, that like, one little decision to put that on that control on a shoulder button as opposed to just being on like an X button made that experience so much more interesting. It's fun to see it pop up in, you know, in like grow home and in juice on as well. Uh, and it sort of takes it to the next level because you're using it to, you're using both triggers to sort of climb hand over hand, mm -hmm. uh, which is really cool. <clears throat> it's very like death stranding on some level. Because you're, um, it, you know, you're not just pressing X to hop from point to point. You just have to plan out your route very carefully, not quite as organically as you would do in that game. Because in, in this, it feels like there is, um, there's like a main path through every area. Yes, yeah. But it's I do not like open the world. You can't like 
go anywhere, climb anything. Like, yeah, anyways, yeah, yeah. There are very few sections where you just stand back and look at the the mountain and just be like, huh, okay, how am I going to do this? It's more just like, okay, where are the, the little handholds that they've put out for me? Mm-hmm. Which is a little, I mean, I, I sort of wish it was more open, but I don't think that, you know, it's not really a slight against it. I still had a really good time sort of scaling yeah. up the mountain. And there were still a number of scenarios where I, I did not know where I was supposed to go. Like I, um, you get stops along the way up the mountain and, um, you'll explore little, little, uh, encampments and stuff. It's a fairly solitary game. Something clearly happened. Uh, and there's a lot of like little journals and and notes you can read and stuff like that, that clue you in on, um, what happened here before and where all the people are and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, ultimately why you're climbing. Um, but, uh, but when you have those stops, it's, it's not always crystal clear when you or where you restart your climb. Um, so you're sometimes looking for context. There are places too, where I would get halfway up a mountain and not know where the next thing I'm supposed to go is. And then realize I had forgotten some, one of the tools that I had learned to like, Oh, I can like, like you said, I can let go of slack and run along the wall to get to a further purchase or mm-hmm, mm-hmm. things like that. So it's, um, yeah, I don't think it's immediately sort of telegraphs exactly what the next step always is. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, it is, it is, Still very linear, I think. Yeah. In a way that Death Stranding isn't. Yeah, yeah. I Slightly yeah. different budget between the two. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Able to build up a slightly larger world in, uh, in right. Death Stranding. Uh, I, so I really enjoy the climbing in this. I feel like it would have been... I, I, I would have enjoyed it much more if they had just done away entirely with the, the sort of story and, like, document-finding aspect of it. Mm. Um, I feel like it was just so cliché. Um, I have the same thoughts about Death Stranding as well. Like, I love the traversal in that game. The storyline is of a mess, as, you know, you would expect <laughs> from a Hideo Kojima. Sure. But I find myself like, oh, man, I really can't wait to play Death Stranding 2. But I'm just like not looking forward to sitting through the story segments in it. I just want to like climb a mountain and you know build roads across some wasteland, and you know, that was really interesting stuff to me. Yeah. But in this I one, am... sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, well, I was saying like <laughs> I really just want to do the mountain climbing stuff in this. Um, I found like the the sort of like documents you find along the way did not add a whole lot to the experience. Like I, I'm. Sure, some people are into it for the mystery, but it just felt like I had seen the story before. Yeah, I can see that absolutely. I um, I think I sort of figured it out about halfway through, and and at that point, I was less invested in continuing to find all the documents and looking in all the corners and stuff like that. Yeah, um, there really is not a lot to do on those stops halfway up the mountain, uh, other than look for documents. So I, I do kind of find myself did kind of find find myself wishing that there was more stuff at the at the stops uh not like you know people to interact with or like other things you can do i just it really felt um like there was a lot of like window dressing to like just hide a document or a note or Mm -hmm. something in a corner of um so yeah i don't know it just it felt uh uh, like it sort of did one thing and it does that one thing really well but uh, i didn't necessarily need all the other stuff um i think it could have probably telegraphed what it ultimately was about uh, without it having to be, uh, um, what you call it, a, uh, a Bioshock style, like yeah, find yes, the hidden exactly. recording to explain exactly what happened in this world. Um, a lot but, of the times yeah. I thought I would be on the path to the next area and just be like going through all these hoops. And it turned out I was just like, oh, it was just to get this collectible or to find yeah. an additional audio log. <laughs> or, or I was like, oh, okay, whatever. Yeah. I like the ending. No, I thought the ending worked. I thought they did a nice job with it. I thought it was it was emotional and it didn't sort of hinge on you finding a note. It was actually the music was beautiful and you got kind of a bit of a payoff and you realized what you were climbing for. And um, uh, yeah, I, I, I liked it. I thought it sort of stuck the landing. Um, I just uh, wish it had a little more confidence in its ability to sort of like transmit or, or tell its story without having to um, kind of rely on the, the lazy step of making it a hunt and find for notes and journals and logs and things like that. Yeah, I, I, it was fine. Mm-hmm. I, I don't feel like the the ending had anything to do with the rest of the game. It was just mm-hmm. sort of like, you know, by the way. Oh. But, you know, well, I, I, I still yeah. enjoyed the uh, just the climbing experience. Yeah. Um, 
I, uh, I, I, one of the things that I sort of liked is that the, the last, it's a couple of chapters. I think it's like six chapters long. Um, and the first three or four chapters are really just sort of like barren desert mountain kind of area. It's like Scrabble, hard Scrabble. And you, you, you use a lot more stamina if you're in the sun and you're frequently in the sun because you're on the outside of this, um, tower and mm -hmm. um, uh, everything kind of looks more or less the same. So it was hard to sort of gauge like how far up am I? Um, am I close to the objective? And then you get into kind of the final three chapters and it mixes up the geography, I think quite a bit. Um, it adds some like weather effects that you have to sort of work around and things like that. And I really liked that variety. I wish that in the yeah. first three chapters, there was more stuff, more environmental things. And, and yeah, I just, it felt uh, like a lot of sort of reused um, visuals. Uh, before it actually, you know, got to a point where it got really interesting and they had um, some luxury of kind of mixing it up a little bit as you got closer and closer to the top of the mountain. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I didn't ruin the game for me by any stretch, but just an observation. Oh, no, no. Yeah, the the middle section where you're just like indoors for a lot, a lot of the time, that almost ruined the game for me. I found that oh, like, <laughs> very uninteresting. <laughs> But thankfully, like as soon as you got outside again, the rest of the game was just amazing after that point. Yeah. So I do appreciate that they they tried to mix it up a little bit, but definitely felt like they they dwelled a little bit too long in that middle chapter. Yeah, it's so hard to get that pacing thing right, right? Just, yeah, yeah, it, and you know, it also is probably dependent on you know, how much time you spend looking for the side stuff or how much time you get lost and wander around in circles, like I probably did. But, uh, you know, putting that aside, I had a, a really good time with this. Yeah. Yeah, I liked it as well. I thought that, uh, that was good. I think it's, it, it definitely sort of feels, uh, you know, experimental and unusual. And, and uh, it, it, it absolutely has a way of kind of interacting with it that is unique, uh, fairly unique in video games. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I liked it. It was uh, it was a cool discovery. Uh, I love that Don't Nod has clearly a couple different teams working on kind of different things and, and they don't really have a house style or a house brand. I think they just sort of do whatever sounds interesting. Um, and, uh, it means that they put out a lot of different games that are, uh, you know, hit a lot of different genres and storytelling kind of styles and stuff like that. And, um, it's always really kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I really, I really am looking forward to Death Stranding too. I just want there to be a mode with no like ghost monsters in it. <laughs> like, I just want to walk over a mountain. Maybe I'll play that new Bennett Foddy game coming out. I forget what it's called. Oh, yeah. Baby Steps, I think. I think that's right. That feels like it might be a little like <laughs> a little further into the silly side of things than I want. But uh, who knows? Who knows? Uh, cool. So this is, um, uh, I played this on uh, Game Pass. It's uh, available there to play as part of your subscription. Um, it is on other consoles and stuff, too, so. Yeah, I don't think it's on the Switch. Uh, I played it on PS5. Cool. Looks um, great. This is called one of yeah. the. Um, <laughs> I don't play a lot of like freshly released AAA level <laughs> games, so um, it's a very beautiful game to look at. Um, yeah, I liked it. I th well, you had mentioned sort of the inside part of it, it almost broke you. Uh, I thought that was the most interesting lighting. There was definitely a oh, lot yeah, of well, the, the scenery was terrific throughout. Like that's yeah. probably what got me through that section. It's just like all the weird. Yeah. Just the location. Kind of Bioluminescent is, is very interesting. things and stuff. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, it was cool. This is called uh, Jusant, J-U-S-A-N-T. Uh, it's a French word by French developers. Um, but, uh, I think it means the receding of the tide. If I remember correctly, when I looked it up. Yeah. I think there's um, like, when you start the game, it explains what that is. I think you're right. Oh, does it? I don't remember that. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe that's where I learned it. Yeah. Um, there's but, like, uh, there's something that it's like, oh yeah, it's French and it means this. So cool. All right. I guess I'm not that smart. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you're just in such a hurry to get into it. You're just like, ah, <laughs> it's like, don't need all this backstory. Just let me climb stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's but, all I uh, yeah. It would be interesting if this got adapted into like a future Uncharted or, or Tomb Raider thing. I, I'm, I always feel like those games would maybe not less Uncharted, but certainly Tomb Raider would be more interesting if it was more just about exploration and it, she didn't have to like, mm -hmm. pick up a gun sometimes and shoot people. This would be an interesting way to like double down on that, make it kind of exploratory, make it tomb raidery and and um <laughs> make her kind of work for some of these discoveries make it mountain climbing treacherous and scary yeah uh, in a way that it's not really in tomb raider i was gonna say i feel like the uncharted games 
they've only gotten like more simplified as they've gone on. Like the first one, I feel like you're actually still doing sort of like puzzle platforming in some environments. But by the end of it, it really is just like find the the yellow glowing thing and <laughs> like push the X button towards it. Yeah, but I mean that's just sort of how that series evolved. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it was really just like a natural extension of being an action movie of sort of embracing the inevitable Indiana Jones of the whole thing. I think in yeah. a lot of ways. Um, whereas uh, I don't know, I always sort of felt like there was a little bit more you could do with the Tomb Raider mold. Yeah, it would be amazing yeah. if they like the next Tomb Raider game that came out was just this open world sort of like free exploration breath of the wild kind of deal. Yes. That'd be amazing. We could only dream. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have time for karma zoo? Where are we at in the recording timeline here? Do we have time? How much you want to say about karma zoo? Uh, karma zoo is a cool, how much beyond uh, the menus beyond the menus, uh, is a cool little kind of cross platform multiplayer experience. Um, up to 10 people can play at once. Um, and, um, you, the objective is for you to earn karma by being a cool player who helps other people. Um, you, uh, you earn little karma points and you can use that to kind of upgrade your character and change uh, to different character models. Each of those character models have kind of different abilities that allow you to then further go into the game and uh, help people more and more. It's a platformer. It's a 2D platformer, essentially. Um, and um, it randomly picks 10 people uh, around the world who are simultaneously playing to dump into a game together. Um, you can't communicate with each other. There's no um, in-game voice chat. Not supported at all. Um, your characters can sing or tweet or um, uh, grunt or bark or whatever, depending on which kind of animal or character you're playing as. Uh, but that is the only way that really you can communicate with others. Um, and you have to work together collectively to solve puzzles, to get across platforms, to, um, uh, help each other, uh, uh, move forward. There's objectives as simple as like you hold down a switch so your friends can go through a door. Um, there's, um, much more difficult ones. There's the ones that I love that keep coming up and it's a random sort of selection of different puzzles and things that you play along. Um, so as you go, it'll pick five different types of puzzles and that becomes your little, like, that's the loop. That's the gauntlet that you run with your nine other players. Huh. Um, uh, the one that I love is, um, uh, all 10 of you have to keep a chain of electricity going, um, by staying exactly the right amount of distance from each <laughs> other, um, to, uh, to keep the electrical current running from player to player to player to light up different light bulbs. And as you light up the different light bulbs around the, uh, around the puzzle field, um, it, uh, uh, opens different pathways and doors and reveals secrets and gives you opportunities to earn more karma and stuff like that. Um, you can be super, uh, it can be super chaotic as you're trying to sort of figure out like where to go and how to be a, a helpful and useful part of the chain. Uh, um, uh, particularly if you have nine other people who are also trying to do the same thing. <laughs> um, uh, and occasionally you get a few people who are like just in it for themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I don't quite understand what the whole point of the thing is to be, uh, <laughs> I was say, to this is giving me like PTSD back to my final fantasy raid group. It's like, how do you, <laughs> how do you not just end up with a troll in the group every single time? Um, it has been surprisingly, I, I played a ton of rounds of this. It just came out a couple weeks ago. It's only seven bucks, eight bucks. Um, like I said, it's cross platform. It's out on most things. So it's been really easy to find kind of randomly selected groups of people to play with because it's on just about every platform and PC. Um, and uh, it's just sort of pulling everybody together into the same instance. Oh, you have to pay um, for it. Yeah, you have to buy the game. Okay, um, okay. So it's, it's not cheap. like... It's well, I was going to say, I imagine if it was free to play, that would just open the floodgates for people oh, jumping sure. into and yeah. just ruin your game. I don't know what... The, yes, that's probably true. You would get a lot more kind of randos. Um, <laughs> you have to like... Uh, you have to be game for the sort of cooperative nature of it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, th there is, you can sort of do the ultimate sacrifice too, which is something I, I kind of like and also find surprisingly dark about the game is that you can sacrifice yourself. There can be like rooms of just giant spikes everywhere or uh, walls with monsters in them that will eat you if you climb up them and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and you can sacrifice yourself. You can be the player who decides you're going to jump in and like fall on the spikes or get eaten by the monster. And when that happens, it puts up a little tombstone uh, where your character died. And then other players can use that tombstone as a platform. <laughs> That's disrespectful. To safely get past, right? It's a little disrespectful. <laughs> Slightly problematic. To safely get past that obstacle. 
um, it's f- and you're rewarded by with karma for doing that. So sometimes we would get to like fields of of uh, spikes, and everybody decides they're going to be the one who <laughs> jumps on the like, spikes. <laughs> not doing this one, you guys. You know, right. good luck. Uh, like, oh wait, well we can't all be the hero. We can't all sacrifice ourselves because mm-hmm. there's no because there's nobody left to solve the puzzle at that point. So again, that's where like using your little bark, your little emote to like uh, uh, to notify each other or to try to sort of convey some message about how to move forward. So. Um, it's fun. I really like it. It's It's got a beautiful visual look. It's got these cool little upgrades. You can turn in karma points to get different character models that have different abilities. I just unlocked an owl and he can glide. Oh. Um, so if there are little flying areas that you need to get to or objectives that are further away, the owl can get there quicker and easier and, and maybe sort of start a path for other players. Um, but uh, each little animal that you unlock has some little kind of fundamental, like the, what is it? The frog can do a triple jump, whereas otherwise yeah. all the other characters can only do a double jump. Um, and things like that. So it's a, it's a zoo full of like dead animals trying to find their way into heaven, uh, by They're being, all dead? Good, uh, well, I mean, yeah, kind of, you're the spirit. You start as a sort of a disembodied spirit. You're essentially a little blob. Oh. Um, and then you can kind of upgrade your body over time. But the, the conceit is ultimately you go through a door at the end into a, into a, a hallway of light. Oh, <laughs> and, wow. uh, yeah. Uh, so there's a whole like, uh, Yeah like sad death thing behind this like frantic, occasionally oddball uh, puzzle platformer. Wow. Um, surprisingly heavy. Turns <laughs> out. It doesn't really lean too much on that. I think if you're not paying attention during the, uh, uh, during the proceedings or, or the, the training session you get at the beginning before you play online, you're probably not going to get a ton of that. It just feels like a, <laughs> like a party game in a lot of ways. It feels like a, like a, like a Mario party or something where you, yeah. you and your friends trying to get through something that seems um, difficult. It does have local um, multiplayer as well. So I can imagine if you had a bunch of folks in your house, this would be super fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the lack of communication online adds an extra oh, little challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, there are people on some of the, uh, the forums and stuff on Reddit that we're talking about, like, Oh, just use discord. Just use discord. I'm like, you don't get it. That's not the point. <laughs> the point is to find a way to communicate with each other. That doesn't include like you speaking to somebody. Um, does so, like yeah, the challenge is a lot of it. Yeah. I, I think the, the challenge is, is, um, trying to be a good, I guess, air quotes person, uh, and help others along and, and, um, you're rewarded by staying close. If people fall behind, they start to blink. And if they, they're left behind for too long, they'll blink out of existence. Ah. They'll just disappear. <laughs> um, so you, you, uh, um, uh, will see somebody falling behind. And if you're the player that goes back and kind of stands next to them, um, or, or plays alongside them, you're rewarded with karma points for that. Um, oh, that's nice. so it really does try to like inspire you to like just be a good player and help others and not let people fall behind and show the pathway and, and help solve puzzles and stuff. And it's cool. I dig it. It's a completely different approach. It does a very sort of like video gamey thing by just being a platformer, but it's a completely different approach to being kind of altruistic and, and um, helpful in the course of playing a game with others. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So if, it, if you run too far ahead, does that also penalize you? Cause then you're too far away from the group. Yes. Well, there's there, you're penalized for just not being a part of the group. You're you're penalized mm. for being selfish. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, and you you can also in that scenario blink out of existence. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so the the hook is is hang out with others, stay close to other yeah, people. Yeah. You know, be um, be a good group member. Right. But that also sort of succeeds in making the game more frantic because then you have ten little disembodied critters trying to like climb up on the same platform at the same time together um, or throwing themselves onto spikes or whatever. Um, so it's, uh, uh, it's good. It, it has sort of created enough kind of interesting little rules around its world uh, to kind of keep it a kind of chaotic and entertaining party game, but also hmm. does something kind of unique with that formula. Oh, that sounds cool. Uh, I, yeah. uh, I'm still like, I can't believe you, you just, um, like, what are the odds of having one troll and a group of 10 people they show up online? It just <laughs> seems like it'd be a given every single time. But uh, sure. like you're saying, they all sort of signed up for this experience. So unless you're just the worst person and you, you got this specifically to troll people, uh, it <laughs> seems, seems like they should all be, you know, on the up and up. Yeah. 
So the lesson here is if Karma Zoo decides to do a free to play weekend, stay yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> stay yeah. far away from that. <laughs> um, but uh, for the rest of us, oh, the, it, um, I, one last sort of note is that it has global objectives as well. Uh, there's a karmic ladder in the game, mm. um, and as more people playing the game worldwide contribute to the karma pool, um, it unlo- unlocks uh, additional levels and upgrades and uh, um, characters and things like that that you can spend your karma points on. So it has this kind of global ticker essentially of everybody, every karma point earned across the globe in the, in the game of karma zoo with all of these kind of milestone objectives. So again, that's one of those kind of like altruistic things where you're pooling your resources and, Mm. and collectively as a, uh, as a worldwide gaming team, essentially trying to unlock new things to do in this game. That's cool. Yeah. It's a very cool thing. Um, This is called karma zoo. Uh, I'm playing it on the Switch, but like I said, it's out on uh, just about everything that I'm aware of uh, right now. And uh, it's fairly cheap, under 10 bucks, and would recommend if any of this sounds fun to you. Uh, and it is super fun uh, to definitely check it out. Do all the different versions contribute to the same global karma pool? I believe so, yes. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Hmm. 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 So it reminds me of like Journey back on the, uh, the PS3. Or, um... Oh, I could see that. What I played recently? Oh, actually, you saw it also reminded me of Journey. Just a weird sort of Journey tieback show. <laughs> Does every game in the desert remind you of Journey? Uh, I mean, it was a lot of it like towards the end, especially, especially when the the music is ramping up. <laughs> but uh, no, <laughs> Karma's plucking those heartstrings. Yeah. yeah, it's all about you know the uh, the nonverbal communication or yeah, like, sort of verbal because you're animals. Does that work? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Not, yeah, uh, hear, yeah. you know, not voiced. And that was the characters in Journeys would like chirp or sing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to like get other players' attention and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And you can actually, um, you can uh, organize uh, voice chat with whoever you were playing with because they wouldn't tell you. So just an extra hoop to jump through. Yes. Yeah. I remember that. Journey was great. That's such a good game. Yeah. Yeah. Journey was great. And it wouldn't tell you who the other players were until the credits rolled, right? If I remember correctly, it said... Yeah, you know, it was like, by the way, the, these are all the people you encountered along the way. But right. there was not really any way to chat with them. Very cool. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so we should wrap this thing up, I guess. I think that's it. Cool. Uh, if you need any more video game hangover in your brain, you should definitely follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash vghangover. And you can always get show notes and links and tell us what you thought about this episode at vghangover.com. Uh, we would love for you to join us on Discord. You can chat about video games. Uh, you can lob questions at us for our Drinktacular episode coming up in December. Uh, you get a link to that at vghangover.com. Uh, and uh, we would love for you to subscribe, rate, and review us on your podcasting app of choice. Uh, we're on all of them. Um, we're else, everywhere. Maybe help us out telling your friends about the show. Yeah, that really helps us out. Uh, bring in new listeners, get their questions with the Drunktacular, get that like last-minute input. You know, just started listening to the show, but I have a weird question for you guys. So, <laughs> Excellent. I love it. Um, we want to give thanks again to Fear of Dark for our intro and outro music this week. If you'd like to hear more of his work, you can go to fearofdark.bandcamp.com and listen to the rest of his discography. Maybe buy an album or two. That would be great. Yeah. We'll be back next week. Until then, this is Randy Dickinson. This is DJ Ross. Thanks for listening to Video Game Hangover. Goodbye. Good night. See ya.